what we're going to do this lecture is uh, see if we can explain the phenomena of hypnosis that we talked about last week by taking uh, what you could think of as a common strand in a number of the theories that we reviewed in the week before that to construct what hopefully is the simplest theory of hypnosis that nonetheless accounts for the, for the phenomena. So this will be the strategy. First of all, I'll outline the theory, discuss its relation to other theories. So that's the cold control theory of hypnosis. We'll talk about how cold control could actually occur, which isn't obvious. And then that will lead on to empirical evidence, to consider the empirical evidence first by relating hypnosis and meditation, uh, then by considering what I consider to be the key test or the key way of testing the theory, uh, and then finally, briefly, asking why does hypnosis exist at all? Why should there be such a phenomenon? So we've talked about higher order thought theory throughout the, the module. The basic idea of higher order theories, whether the higher order thought, higher order perception, or whatever they are, is to distinguish content which is about the world, that's first order content, from second order content, which is content about mental states per se. And the idea of the higher order theories is that you need second order content in order for mental states to be conscious. Now that's typically discussed well, either in the philosophical or psychological literature with respect to perceptual states. So a blind sight patient uh, on these sorts of theories has unconscious seeing because he or she sees but is not aware of the seeing. But perception doesn't exist, all the mental states that exist, and for example uh, there are intentions. So an intention is a mental state that doesn't have content that's just describing the world. It has imperative content. It has content like lift the arm, which is only satisfied when the arm lifts. So that's first order content, because although it's a command rather than a description, it is about the world. It's about the arm. So the intention in itself, or simple intentions like doing actions, uh, first order states, and by higher order th theory, an intention in itself would be unconscious unless you're aware of having that intention by having a, a suitable higher order state. For example, the thought, I intend to lift my arm. And it's only when you have that, I intend to lift my arm, that the intention, lift the arm, is a conscious mental state. So that means, on this approach, control, like executive control, isn't intrinsically conscious. Executive control means, incidentally, something like uh, con control that's implemented not by virtue of habit. So overcoming a habit would be an example of executive control. So if you normally, when driving down the road, uh, turn right at the traffic lights to come to university, and that's your habit, but today you decide to turn left to buy some milk, that would be executive control, but turning left would be, because your habit is to turn right and you have to overcome that habit in order to do this, to do this new action. Now there's a tradition of regarding executive control as being necessarily conscious within psychology and we've talked about Jacobi in that context because overcoming habit is what exclusion is and uh, exclusion is his measure of a uh, state being conscious right so on the on the Jacobi approach overcoming ha habit is intrinsically conscious and Norman and Chalice who introduced the notion of executive control, at least to the neuro neuropsychology literature, 
also regarded as executive control as in some way intrinsically conscious. But from a higher order thought perspective, there's no reason why you couldn't have a first order intention that was operating in an executive way that was unconscious. So there's no necessary relationship between executive control and consciousness. And when I first thought about that, I thought that's a little bit odd because mainly you don't turn left at the traffic lights if you have it to turn right unless you're conscious of the intention to turn left. Normally they do go together. But then I thought there is a situation where the two come apart and that's hypnosis, at least it seems to be hypnosis, in that uh, people seem to have intentions to do things and that they do do things uh, while claiming that they have no intentions. And maybe that's why hypnosis seems so strange and bizarre is precisely because it's executive control without higher order thoughts uh, about the intentions that constitute that executive control. So the idea is that that is intrinsically what hypnotic response is. It's forming an intention in the executive system to perform the behavioral or cognitive action. So by cognitive action, I mean the action isn't necessarily just lifting your arm. It could be imagining something. It could be directing your attention in a certain way. Without forming accurate higher order thoughts about intending that action, indeed, you form inaccurate higher order thoughts, namely thoughts to the effect that you're not intending to perform that action. So now, cold control isn't in a sense, isn't a, a new idea. Actually, let me just go back and just say, why is it cold control? Well, because it's control, executive control, without accurate hots. So, cold control. So, cold control is really an old idea because you find it in the previous literature, but it's an idea that cross-cuts the normal uh, classification of theories into roughly something like believers, dissociation approaches versus the more skeptical sociocognitive approaches. So I'll just quickly go through some of those approaches and indicate which are compatible with co-control and which are not. Well, with Hilgard's dissociation theory, the executive ego was split into two. This half forms intentions to do things in order to carry out the hypnotic suggestion, but the other half is unaware because of an amnesic barrier of the intentions in the half that's been split off. So Hilgard's dissociation theory, at least... Uh, he talked about it in different ways at different times, but at least in this way of talking about it, involves having intentions without uh, awareness of those intentions. So in his case, it's maybe slightly complicated by the fact that uh, maybe this half here, this bit of the ego that's been split off could have accurate higher order thoughts, and it's this other half that wouldn't have accurate higher order thoughts. So that's complicated, because you have two streams of consciousness, right? But in any case, it's sort of a version of the theory, if a somewhat complex version. A version in the dissociation tradition that'll be close is maybe uh, Kilstrom, who talked about having intentions without awareness of those intentions. On the other hand, if we stick within uh, uh, dissociation theory, the dissociated control theory of Eric Woody uh, is explicitly about the executive ego being weakened so that executive intentions are not needed and not used anymore. There is just automatic triggering of the relevant cognitive control structures. So somehow actions are performed and things happen without intentions. And what that means is you certainly couldn't have executive control happening. You 
wouldn't have intentions at his active level, according to this theory. So hypnosis isn't about having intentions and not being aware of those intentions. It's about not having intentions on this theory. So that is not cold control. Or well, within sociocognitive theory, what Spanos argued was people do strategically, intentionally perform actions, but because of the demand characteristics of the situation, they misattribute the causes of those actions and think it's hypnosis and not them. So this is a version of cold control theory. On the other hand, within the sociocognitive tradition, Response expectancy theory says that hypnotic actions are directly caused by the expectancy that those actions will happen. Because you expect so strongly your arm will lift by itself, like the placebo effect with a strong expectation that you won't feel pain causes the analgesia, so the strong expectation that your arm will rise by itself causes the arm to rise as if by itself without needing uh, an intention to cause that to happen. So this is not cold control. So what I'll go on to argue that um, while the theoretical mechanism of hypnosis is far from settled and we still don't know, the cold control perspective, namely that hypnosis involves intentions without awareness of those intentions which cross cuts the normal theories and is compatible with dissociation or sociocognitive perspectives is very much in the running because the theories that go against it have some strong counter evidence I believe. So from the sociocognitive perspective the idea that expectations are the sole and final psychological mediator of hypnotic response doesn't square with the evidence that expectations do, do not in fact actually fully predict hypnotic response. And hypnotic analgesia does not behave like placebo analgesia, as we discussed in the previous lecture. But there is something about expectancies we need to build into our theory, so we'll talk about that. <coughs> and in terms of dissociation theories, uh, it seems that hypnotic response can involve the overcoming of habit, in fact the inhibition of a habit, in fact exclusion in a Jacobi sense. It involves executive function, therefore, uh, and therefore it seems a theory that says hypnosis is like a fully functional prefrontal lobotomy doesn't do justice to the facts. So that sort of leaves cold control. But what we'll do is we'll consider the evidence, because as I say, uh, the matter is far from settled. So that is cold control theory. Are there any questions about that before I carry on? Now let me just ask you, uh, you're rubbing your pencil against your lips there. Did you intend to do that? No, um, probably on some sense, some level I did, but... You weren't aware of any no, intention no, no. Uh, to do that? Oh, well, yeah, no, I wasn't. I mean, you did mean to do it, it wasn't like... Uh, I was aware uh, of doing it, but not... I didn't think, I'm going to now do that. Yes, I exactly right. And, and that, that was the point I wanted to make, is that we often perform actions without being aware of the intentions to perform those actions. Life is full of those... Uh, types types of occasions, but that but that action nonetheless wasn't the same as a hypnotic response, because what you had there was a sort of unreflective, fairly brief action in which you weren't aware of the intention. But as soon as you reflect on, did you mean to do the action? Was it intentional? You probably came to the conclusion, well, yeah, I did mean to do it. Um, it was intentional, in some sense, right? Whereas and, and normally that's what happens. While we go through life often with intentions, not having higher order thoughts about those intentions, when the action is sustained and we reflect on whether it's intentional or not, at least 
me personally, I, I find it hard not to have accurate higher order thoughts about the fact that I was intending to do it. Perception's a little bit diff uh, different in that, um, that, at least except in higher order thought theory, that whenever we have conscious perception, we, have, we do have higher order thoughts of perceiving. Um, it seems we just habitually and compulsively have higher order thoughts about perceiving all the time, probably to a stronger degree than intentions. Nonetheless, with intentions, um, we will have those higher order thoughts if we reflect on it, reflect on the action. As so a question arises, how does it come about that at least some people can uh, not just stop having accurate higher order thoughts, but have and sincerely hold with uh, some conviction incorrect higher order thoughts that they were not intending to perform that action. So that, that's the difficult thing to explain. And somehow high, uh, highly hypnotizable people are, are sort of good, if you like, at avoiding these accurate higher order thoughts and instead having the inaccurate ones. So let's just consider how that could happen. Well, one thought, which I only suggest here is part of the answer, is that higher order thoughts are, well, thoughts, and so should be responsive to the same influences uh, as thoughts in general are, uh, and so should be responsive to expectations, just to say, Kirsch argues that a hypnotic response is sensitive to expectations. Our brain generally strives to create consistency between our thoughts and beliefs. We can't do it completely, but at least it strives to do so. At least there's pressure to do so. So the expectancy that an action will occur, occur involuntary might just put a bit of pressure on higher order thoughts to go more one way than another way. And that would be consistent with the evidence for a role of expectancy in hypnotic response. And this is the sort of evidence that uh, Irving Kirsch reviews. One is the general responsiveness of hypnotic subjects to demand characteristics. And we, we talked about in a previous lecture that even applies to the feeling of involuntariness itself and what that means to the subject in that experiment by Stephen J. Lynn where if people are told you cannot resist the motion, they at least tell you they find it really difficult to resist the motion when asked to resist a hypnotic suggestion and carry out the motion. At least when put in a situation where they're not seriously under pressure. We're not, we're not uh, challenging their moral principles or something like that. The correlation between expectation expectancies of responding and responding can be reasonably high in some studies. Uh, I quote some numbers which frankly are on the high side when we look at studies as a whole, um, but at least sometimes they're, they're quite high. So if we give suggestions without an induction, no hypnotic induction, the correlation between the expectancy of responding to that particular suggestion and the response to that suggestion is about 0.5, or at least it can be or is in some studies. So point three is probably more normal. It depends how you ask the, uh, the questions. And uh, after an induction, we also get, if you say, I'm now going to give you a suggestion that your arm will be so light that it rises in the air, how much do you expect to respond to that suggestion? Well, you get a correlation of, at well, least in this study, about point six between the expectancy to respond to that particular suggestion and the response to that suggestion. And as I mentioned in previous lecture, the increase in response produced by hypnotic inductions is accompanied by an equivalent increase in expectancy that subjects will respond. So expectancy certainly plays a role and one might uh, wonder about the causal direction so one way you could get a correlation here is because of your past experience of being hypnotized, gives you knowledge about your hypnotic responding, 
and uh, that then informs your expectancy. People have done studies trying to tease, tease that apart, and uh, you do find causal direction can go in both, cause can go in both directions. So expectancies are important, but there is a problem with them being the sole explanation. So the problem with saying that um, hypnotic response is just like a placebo, but all we need to talk about is the expectancy that you will respond. And that is, expectancies aren't really quite powerful enough to produce hypnotic response. So with a uh, hypnotic suggestion, we could get people to hallucinate a pink elephant in the room right here. But expectancies <coughs> don't seem to be able to produce <coughs> those sorts of perceptual experiences for a sustained period in clear viewing conditions. And just to prove the point, uh, an experiment by Wagstaff from Liverpool involved showing people a piece of paper. It had something like, I can't remember now, but say it has a six on it. And you say, how strong do you expect there'll be a six on the next sheet of paper? There's a six on it. Say, okay. Now how strong do you expect there'll be a six on the next sheet of paper? Ah, there's a six on it. How strong do you expect there'll be a six on the next piece of paper? And you just do this a few times until the expectancies go right up. And the person says, I'm 100% convinced there's going to be a six on the next sheet of paper. And there isn't. And do they see the six? No. They say there's no six there. So despite having, and that's an experiment you can repeat at home. So despite having, well, the subject claims to be something like 100% uh, expectancy that they will see something, in fact, they don't see it in clear viewing, sustained clear viewing conditions when it wasn't there. But the role um, that we have expectancy playing in cold control theory would be perfectly comfortable with that because the function of expectancy isn't to produce the perceptual experience itself. It's to push the higher order thoughts more one way than another. So in order to hallucinate, you'd have to form the intention to... Uh, imagine, say there's a pink elephant there, and the explanation goes like this, you imagine there's a pink elephant there, you're not aware though of your intention to imagine that, but we know from say fMRI studies that imagination produces activation in the, in the visual areas, and there's arguments that it goes all the way down to V1, so you get visual representations formed, but it doesn't seem to you that you produce them because you're not aware of your intention to imagine. So the obvious explanation is it was caused externally and it's a perception. That would be the cold control theory of perceptual experiences, in other words, hallucinations produced hypnotically. The visual representation on that account is caused by your intention to imagine. Is it caused, in other words, by your imagination? It's not caused by the expectancy. So that the function of the expectancy is not to cause the visual representation, it's to cause or to push the higher order thought more towards I was not intending to produce that visual representation. So an implication of uh, cold control theory, by the way, is because it's strategically produced by the, the executive system, is that hypnotic hallucinations and so on will in general be contextually appropriate. They don't just happen willy-nilly, just because you expect something. They happen because you brought it about by the executive system, and hence, by and large, hypnotic responses will be consistent with your overall goals, strategies, and projects. And that fits in with the conclusions I drew from the last lecture about the contextual appropriateness of hypnotic response. So expectations, part of the story, but still uh, it feels a bit inadequate, we need to say more and I'm not actually going to give, be able to give a fully adequate explanation of, of how one could systematically form inaccurate higher order thoughts, but I want to wave my hands a bit in the hopefully something like the right direction. So one question you could ask is, what brain region might be involved in producing hypnotic response. 
And you might remember from the subliminal perception lectures this study by Lau and Passingham, where they had devised two, they devised a visual discrimination task where you had to say uh, diamond or square. Was it a diamond there or was it a square? And the, the shape was metacontrast masked. And the interesting thing about metacontrast masking is you can have, you have an inverted uh, U-shape. Or, or a U-shape, not inverted U-shape. You have a U-shape. So that as you increase the SOA, uh, you get the objective performance uh, deteriorating and um, improving. So you can find two SOAs where you have exactly the same uh, objective performance, but different degrees of belief that you saw something. So the proportion of times people said they were guessing versus seeing is different. So the degree of metacognitive accuracy is different for exactly the same um, level of objective discrimination, first order discrimination performance. So in other words, you find conditions where the quality of the first order representation is, at least to first approximation, the same, but the higher order thoughts differ in their level of accuracy. And when uh, you see which region of the brain might be associated with having accurate higher order thoughts, it turned out to be the mid dorsal atrial prefrontal cortex. So one conjecture is that that area is a sort of hot box responsible for creating accurate higher order thoughts. Now, it might just be to do with perception, but this is frontal regions which are pretty, as a rule, generic and not tied to particular perceptual domains. So it seems reasonable to suppose that if that area is at least one of the areas responsible for creating accurate higher order thoughts, that it wouldn't be tied to just visual perception, but would be more, more general, and might, for example, be related to higher order thoughts about intentions. So let's say we could disrupt the hot box with repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, RTMS, which is when you put a coil just over the head and uh, apply an alternating magnetic field. What that does is for a region underneath where the coil is, it causes the neurons to fire and then fatigue and then they aren't much good for some minutes. For the parameters we're going to use, they're not much good for about five minutes. So in, in a rough and, and somewhat weak sense, you produce a functional lesion in that area. You stop it working, at least you stop it working as well as it normally does. So let's just accept that this story is right and we can target particular areas. If we have targeted the hot box with that, it'll be harder to create accurate higher order thoughts. So it'll be easier to form intentions without knowing one has. And because that's exactly what hypnotic response is, according to theory, it should be easier to experience hypnotic suggestions. At least that was the logic that we used. For the way that we apply TMS, what you do is you, um, you apply it for five minutes. This is one hertz RTMS. And then you have a five minute window in which you can do something which there should be some loss of function in, in that area. That was just enough time to give the subject two suggestions. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll give a five minute burst there, give them two suggestions, another five minute burst, give them two suggestions. And the TMS could be applied to an area of the vertex, which is right at the top here, uh, which, as far as we can tell, has got nothing to do with anything relevant to the experiment, or it was applied to uh, frontal regions. Sam Hutton here applied the TMS. Then he left the room, the hypnotist came in, and 
didn't know, was blind to, which region had uh, just been zapped. Uh, so the way the hypnotic suggestions were given or the ratings were taken or how the hypnotist behaved uh, shouldn't be affected by knowledge of what should happen. So these are the suggestions we gave. Magnetic hands, which you experienced, hands being pulled together. Arm levitation, rigid arm, and sweet and sour taste in the mouth. So in terms of the categoriz categorization suggestions I gave in the first hypnosis lecture, we have motor suggestions, challenge suggestions, challenge suggestion, and the cognitive suggestion. Subjects rated the experience on a zero to five scale. The zero meant there's no change in my experience. And five meant uh, the uh, experience was, was fully convincing as if it was real. So now the zero line here means no difference between vertex and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. These are confidence intervals, and for any given suggestion, they're quite broad. But when we average the suggestions together to get an overall difference, the confidence interval excludes zero, which means there was a significant difference between the vertex and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in the predicted direction. So that zapping the, um, the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex increased the degree of hypnotic response. By around about a quarter of a unit on that zero to five scale. So it wasn't a big effect, but we could pick it up. After we ran the first 12 subjects, where well, we did get a significant result, I'm slightly worried because when you apply TMS here, you get muscle contractions, which you don't get here. At the top, you just feel it's like a tap on your head, tap, 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 that's what you feel. But when you come around more, more frontally here, you cause the muscles to contract, which can be really quite painful. So my worry was that subjects would believe the painful treatment, that was the powerful shit. This was when something was meant to happen. So what we did was, for the last 12 subjects, we took expectancy ratings how much do you expect to respond to the suggestion? We could partial it out, and the effect remains after partialing out expectancy. So it was not caused by expectancy. So the first 12 subjects showed the effect. The last 12 subjects showed the effect. So maybe you could say the results are convincing, but I regard RTMS is a bit of a black heart, particularly, well, in any case it's a black heart, but particularly the way that uh, we did it. We didn't do a structural scan first to locate the regions of interest. We used an EEG uh, hat and, and used that to find the region of interest. And really, when you apply TMS, whether we use a structural scan or not, but particularly since we didn't, you really don't know exactly where you're getting with the TMS and in any case it gets a reasonable area. The notion that we could have isolated a hot box is slightly silly. It's, it's really like we gave someone a great big kick in the head and then afterwards we found uh, a change in hypnotic response. Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the TMS, um, just a sort of a side question, how sort of fine, like you mentioned it's quite diffuse, but how sort of diffuse is it really? How accurate can you go, TMS? How precise could you yeah, go? Yeah, how precise, yeah. Uh, you can't go deep, so you get the brain, <coughs> brain regions uh, near the top here. Um, I mean, we use, as I said, uh, an, an EEG cap, which has different marked areas, which are meant to roughly correspond to different brain areas, but people's brains are very different. Um, and even when you've done an fMRI scan, you do these morphing procedures to standardise. It's still far from clear, you know, how well you're really localising different bits of the brain. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is a fairly big area with lots of different functions. Being a hot box, if it is one of its functions, is certainly only one of its functions. So I'm not really sure how far, how precisely we can show. We could say we've localised it. Uh, and in any case, the results 
a fairly blunt in the sense they would also fit the dissociated control theory of um, Bowers and Woody that say that hypnosis is a state of weakened executive function, right, which I've contrasted with cold control theory just now. But in fact, these particular results would, could be used to fit in with, with either of those theories. But one thing I'm pleased about is these days there's a greater sense that we need to be, we need more direct replications of the studies that psychologists do. And we should, what we tell undergraduates and what we tell people is the way science works, right, is you do an experiment and nobody believes it until different labs have replicated it. But that isn't what happens. That hasn't been what happens. But it is starting to happen now. So these people at Macquarie University, this team at Macquarie, is going to do a direct replication of the study. And if they get a result, I'll certainly believe it more than if they don't. In any case, whatever result they get, I'll link to their paper when it comes out so people can assess both sets of evidence. Maybe one reason for believing the results should replicate is this sort of conceptual replication. There's more than one ways of get, more than one way of getting at the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And another way is, for example, alcohol. I mean, alcohol has large effects all over the brain, but one of the first major areas that it hits is the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So Rebecca Simmons-Wheeler, as part of her PhD, got people drunk using the um, procedures in Dora Duca's lab here. Or you can have placebo alcohol. You can lace a glass with alcohol around the rim. It smells like alcohol. And people will rate drinking placebo alcohol that they feel warmth and lightheaded and so on, have various uh, sensations associated with being drunk. So we talked some mediums and uh, had uh, either a placebo group or group that drank the equivalent of um, two and a half pints in 30 minutes. So it's a fair amount of alcohol. People get quite drunk on that. She gave them nine hypnotic suggestions taken from the Stanford uh, hypnotic scale and got a fairly big difference here. So that amounts to, in terms of the 0 to 5 scale that I was talking about before, that would be almost one unit on that scale difference. So that's a pretty large effect. And it's occurred individually for the motor challenge and cognitive suggestions. So I find this really useful information. So when I go around and give talks on hypnosis, sometimes people say, well, will you hypnotize us? And a uh, year or two, a couple of years ago now in Poland when this happened, I said, well, let's go to the pub and then we'll do it. And uh, indeed, I think I got a, a pretty good response. So the conclusion is that disrupting frontal regions, including the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, so not to your point, well, how precise can you really be? I don't really know. We kick people in the frontal lobes, basically, increases hypnotic suggestibility. So this is the hypothesis. Frontal regions subserve metacognition, and hypnosis is intrinsically metacognitive, and that's why you get the results you do. But the notion that it's specifically to do with metacognition, and even then specifically to do with higher order thoughts, uh, is not settled by these results. The results support more generally what you could call some form of hypofrontality. Hypo meaning lowered, frontality meaning frontal function. Indeed, there are theories around that um, altered states of consciousness generally involve hypofrontality, reduction in function of the frontal regions. And I speak against hypnosis being intrinsically involving good inhibition or attention. So we talked about monoideism um, in the theories lecture, and I said that had already been ruled out, but this is another way of uh, 
considering evidence against it. When James Braid uh, coined the term hypnosis around about 1840, his theory was it involved sustained unremitting concentration on one idea. So that was the original theory of hypnosis, as it were, when the term hypnosis was coined. But that doesn't seem to be. Not only is it not sleep, which hypnosis, the word hypnosis implies, uh, it's not in itself good concentration or focus on a single idea. Okay, so now I wonder what you would predict for the following experiment. Have you heard of ego depletion? Do people know what that means? So this is the idea that, uh, uh, well, Baumeister's idea is that you have a will, something like a willpower muscle, and that if you use it intensively, you fatigue it, and then you don't have much willpower for a bit until you recover. And that process is called ego depletion. To exhaust your willpower muscle, you just need to give someone a difficult inhibitory task, like maybe a difficult Stroop task. So they're having to inhibit things a lot, five minutes. And then the idea is with the diminished willpower you have afterwards, you might give into temptation more likely. The smell of cookies might make you eat more co cookies beside you, even if you would rather not in the long run, all things considered. Now, we don't have to buy into that particular theory, and there are some reasons for not buying into that theory. But um, one could just accept that what one does is disrupt the functioning of the executive system in some way by the ego depletion process. You reset the executive system so that it's functioning in a, in a different way and not such a sustained way on that single task. What do you think would happen to hypnotic response after an ego depletion manipulation? Well, I would increase, like, I reckon. You reckon increase hypnotic response? Yeah. Oh. But just because it seems to fit in with the fact that you're reducing, yeah, executive function. Um, yeah. Same way with alcohol and TMS. Yeah. So in terms of that narrative of, of hypofrontality, reducing mm -hmm. executive function, that's right. That's what you would predict. Anybody else think otherwise? So I didn't know what to expect uh, before we ran the study, but Ryan Scott had a project student uh, run this study. You give people either a difficult Stroop task, which is ego depleting, or a very easy equivalent task, so it's relatively non-depleting. And when you look at the uh, degree of self-rated hypnotic response, depletion has reduced hypnotic response. Now, why I find that interesting is that uh, Ryan has also tried to look at the effects of depletion on metacognitive tasks and has not so far found any evidence that depletion affected metacognition. So, but we, we can't be sure about that, but um, let's say that that in the end will stand up that depletion doesn't affect metacognition. It affects the executive system in other ways like maybe the priorities you give different tasks, the ability to sustain on a particular task, uh, but it doesn't affect accuracy of higher order thoughts. Well then you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect depletion to increase hypnotic response. So this is quite a nice contrast in that it's a manipulation that affects executive functioning but isn't known to affect accuracy of higher order thoughts, unlike the previous manipulations I've talked about, alcohol and TMS to this region, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So I was quite pleased with that. I, I couldn't have predicted it would go that way round uh, in advance, but I was quite pleased it went that round because that, that way round because it helps focus the theoretical conclusions. It's not just hypofrontality in general that's important. 
when you reduce executive function with a task, which there's no evidence that it affects metacognition, you do not increase hypnotic response. So uh, that helps to be more sure of the interpretation of the preceding results um, and um, help support the notion that the reason why alcohol increases hypnotic response is because it reduces the ease with which one has uh, accurate higher order thoughts. So now really we, what we're going to talk about now is carrying on exactly the, the, the same theme but I put it as a separate section here because there's a fair amount to uh, say about it and meditation mindfulness is interesting in its own right. So now, hypnosis and meditation both involve absorption, attentional regulation, and in a ther therapeutic point of view, they both affect the treatments of stress, depression, and pain. People think about both of them as involving altered states, at least some people do in both cases. So I might be tempted to say, in some sense, they're really the same thing. And that's the issue I want to talk about. So when I say meditation here, I'm really talking about uh, mindfulness, which comes to us through sort of two separate traditions. There was uh, mainly the Buddhist tradition, that's where the term comes from as well, but there's also the uh, ancient Greek tradition from about 300 BC, who had a notion and set of practices to do with mindfulness. They're not formal meditation practices. And then we have the Buddhist tradition, which comes to us. Well, largely it's so big in the West because of two people. John, John Kabat-Zinn, largely from a Zen perspective, implemented um, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction and some other treatments from 70s, 80s onwards. And then the Dalai Lama from late 80s onwards encouraged on what's been an almost annual basis, a meeting of uh, Buddhists, especially Tibetan Buddhists, and scientists to discuss points of overlap. And scientists have been so impressed by these meetings uh, that it's encouraged research into mindfulness, and that research has been so encouraging that now mindfulness is just everywhere in UK, America, and uh, elsewhere. So now mindfulness is a sort of meta metacognition. It involves, what, and what it is, is an awareness of mental states. I put an eye here, I don't mean to presuppose a higher order perception theory, I'm just trying to graphically represent awareness. So this could be a thought about mental states, doesn't have to be a perception. It specifically involves having equanimity, detachment and, and uh, compassion will be consistent with it. So it involves a certain mode of being aware, but it certainly involves awareness and noticing your mental states as mental states as they arise and as they pass. So it involves higher order states which you meant to cultivate to be accurate. So you accurately notice when you're having certain states, which states trigger other states, uh, no, which states follow other states and, and how they come and go. So if it achieves its aim in doing that, the higher order thoughts should be accurate. That's what mindfulness is essentially about, accurate higher order thoughts. But according to cold control, hypnotic responding is intrinsically about having an inaccurate higher order thought, specifically an inaccurate higher order thought of intention, of, of, of intending. So when the aims are achieved, mindfulness, meditation, and hypnotic response are opposites. So what we just concluded, before talking about deal no deal, is that there's a tension between mindfulness meditation. Uh, in other words, meditation largely through the, the Buddhist tradition, although mindfulness crops up, crops up in other traditions as well. But all Buddhist meditation involves training in mindfulness. There's a tension between mindfulness and hypnotic response. And one way of testing this that Rebecca did was to select 
people who were highly practiced in mindfulness meditation and measured their hypnotizability on the Waterloo, which is the instrument we've been using to screen people since about 2006. So we had a large database of hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of uh, people. And the mean for our database out of 12 suggestions is, is uh, here, around about 5 out of 12. And the meditators score on average 2. Now, three and below counts as a low, a low hypnotizable. So the meditators as a group were scoring as lows. And um, that huge discrepancy uh, remained when we controlled for age, because they tended to be uh, considerably older than average than, uh, than our group, gender, slightly different gender balance. And we put in some measures of expectations and attitudes towards hypnosis. Well, we put in a, an attitudes questionnaire, a standard attitudes questionnaire, either the one by Span or some of McConkey. And when you can vary that out, it didn't account for the difference. But nonetheless, people embedded in a religious tradition might have various attitudes which are relevant to hypnosis. And often people in um, religious traditions have negative attitudes about hypnosis. We didn't pick up on that, but I don't want to, yeah, rule it out completely. In any case, this is a correlational study. In effect, um, this is not causal because people self-select for being meditators. So the sort, sort of person who selects and will persist with a meditation practice for so long uh, might be a sort of person who has all sorts of characteristics. So we, we can't say for sure that there's a, um, a causal relationship between mindfulness practice and lowered uh, hypnotic response. But that's precisely the issue that uh, Daisy and Taya are looking at where we're doing a mindfulness intervention and seeing where well, people are randomly assigned to, to conditions and uh, seeing if that affects hypnotic response. So that's ongoing and we don't know the answer. Other correlation ways of getting at the relationship is with uh, the mindfulness questionnaires. So Rebecca used um, these two questionnaires and they asked things like, I find myself doing things without paying attention, which you would score low on mindfulness for. Or when I'm walking, I deliberately notice the sensations of my body moving. And what you find is um, high score, particularly low on mindfulness questionnaires, uh, Lows in the middle and meditators, as you expect, uh, particularly highly on it. So highs are less mindful than meditators. So now we turn to some studies. I don't know if do people recognize this face here. Yes, <laughs> it's him, at the, him at the back. So for uh, this is some work Peter's been doing actually ever since his uh, final year project for his BSc, um, looking at time and intentions. <clears throat> Dreyfus is a Buddhist scholar, and um, we'd already got going with this research, and then um, I noticed that he had said mindfulness practitioners should be able to distinguish more carefully their intentions. And he goes on to say psychologists really should be looking at the ability of um, meditators to notice the timing of their intentions, comparing this to non-meditators, and that's uh, exactly uh, what we had been doing. I'm not sure if you've heard of Libet, the Californian neurosurgeon, probably crops up in your courses. What he did was, and this is our version um, of the Libet apparatus, built by Peter Nash, I'm not sure if that face looks familiar to you. A couple of weeks back, he was he was sitting um, at, the, at the back of the, the lecture hall here. So he's been the president of various hypnosis societies uh, in the UK and is a key hypnosis researcher in the UK. He also likes building things in his garage. <laughs> so uh, he, he built this Libet clock 
what happens is the hand here goes around every two and a half seconds it does a complete revolution the subject puts their finger on this little pouch here which when it's down there completes a circuit just here now if the finger rises you break the circuit so the device knows when the person has lifted a finger what the subject has to do is for each trial is not decide when they're going to lift the finger in advance but just wait for a bit and then when the urge hits them an act of their own free random random free will lift the finger but then notice where was this hand at the time that they had the urge or the intention to lift so the idea here is can you be aware of when your intention to lift first appeared and that's what the subject is trying to subjectively give you now the finding from the bet was um, on average but there's huge variability um, as we'll see a couple of hundred uh, milliseconds before the finger lifts people on average report an urge to lift but it can the urge can occur after the lifting of the finger um, or before with a fair amount of variation. What excited people a lot about the Libet findings was you could pick up on a readiness potential that predicted the lifting uh, some considerable time before the person was aware of the intention. So that's been the, the finding that spurned a lot of philosophical discussion. But what we're interested in was simply people's awareness of their intention first forming to lift the finger. So here's one conjecture. Why are some people more able to avoid accurate higher order thoughts of intending? In other words, highly hypnotizable people. Why, why are they like that? Well, one reason could be that the uh, some people are just less aware of their intentions in general and they're slower uh, a um, consequence of that is they're slower to be aware of, the, of their intentions when they do happen so if you're a person who finds it um, harder to become aware of your intentions so you're slower to be aware of those intentions in general you might be able to be more able to strategically be completely unaware of those intentions in order to play the game of hypnosis at least that might be one sort of highly hypnotizable person. On the other hand, mindfulness practice in involves cultivating awareness of mental states, including specifically intentions. That's part of the full Buddhist package of what you, um, what you pay attention to in terms of your mental states. Intentions is one of the, the uh, is on the list. So, with a lot of practice of becoming. Um, aware of intentions, you might acquire more fine-grained concepts of intentions, be able to pick up on intentions earlier. At least that's a conjecture. So the basic idea is participants report the time at which they experience the intention to move, and we compared highs, mediums and lows, and experienced meditators. So this is the timing of the what Libet calls the W judgment, uh, W for will. So the, the time in which you're aware of the will or urge or intention to lift your finger. Zero is the point at which the finger moved. So you should really, uh, your intention should really be before that point if um, you have some reasonable accuracy. And for most people it is, but highly hypnotizable people on average it's a good hundred milliseconds afterwards. So they are particularly slow in becoming aware of their intention to move. And meditators are particularly early <coughs> in their awareness of their intentions, just as we predicted. Then 
uh, last year we had a um, <coughs> follow-up study. But in this case, we didn't have um, any meditators, but we had a, another mindfulness scale which we gave to everybody, five percent mindfulness scale. And we screened people. They hadn't been screened for hypnotizability. We screened, we, we screened them for um, hypnotic response, for hypnotizability. And we gave them the Livet task. And reassuringly, we essentially replicate. So um, now when we look at people's hypnotizability score and their, and their W timings, the more hypnotizable they are, the later they become aware, yes. You mentioned um, a few weeks ago that the stability of hypnotizability was mm. about 0.75. Over 25 years, yeah. yes. Would we then be able to predict that mindfulness would have exactly the same stability over the same time, and then use that as a hypothesis to see whether they're the same, whether they're just inverse? Yes, it's an interesting question how stable mindfulness is over time. That's that's a good point. I don't know of studies that have that have looked at that. And the correlation we have here is minus 0.45 between hypnotizability and mindfulness. So they're not the same thing, same things, but opposites. Although they it's clearly a sort of a tension between them. What what is true in terms of the stability of mindfulness is that um, Buddhist meditators spend years cultivating the mindfulness and they clearly don't think that one year, two years, three years, five years is enough that they need to work bloody hard in other words to change the mindfulness. So just because something's stable doesn't mean you can't change it of course but the notion that it takes hard work to change it uh, would fit the notion that actually it's pretty stable. Unless you do something and you work seriously to change it. Yeah, that's a good point. So highly hypnotizable people report a later time of intention than less hypnotizable people, and mindfulness meditators, by contrast, report an earlier time than non-meditators. So that fits the conjectures uh, that we started with, that there's a tension between mindfulness and hypnotic ability, and furthermore, that a certain sort of highly hypnotizable person may be one who's just sort of chronically less aware of intentions in general, and that's why they can be strategically less aware of them in the context of a uh, hypnosis session. But before we leave this um, point, I, I just want to talk about some interesting research conducted in a series of papers by uh, Devon Tahoon. It's part of a larger or a older idea that there's more than one way of being a highly hypnotizable person. In other words, a highly hypnotizable person is just not, isn't just one sort of person. So the way he broke them up was by giving people a dissociative experiences questionnaire and um, then categorizing people into low dissociators and high dissociators. And finding that the highs who are high dissociators and the highs that are low dissociators as determined by responses on this, on this questionnaire, respond in sometimes opposite ways, fundamentally different ways. <coughs> and it's maybe the low dissociators, he argues, that have less executive control. Sorry, the high dissociators have less executive control. So when I, so in the, in the studies that um, I've spoken about, where people, people get drunk, you increase the hypnotizability. Um, we, we kick them in the head with TMS in the frontal regions, increase the hypnotizability. Maybe that's the high dissociative, well, what Devon Toon calls the high dissociative pathway to um, good hypnotic response. And maybe one way of thinking about that is uh, some people for whom, as I've just been talking about, have a chronically low coupling, if you like, or link between higher order thoughts and mental states like intentions. So because the link between higher order thoughts and intentions is relatively weak, that's why they can <clears throat> destroy that link strategically in a context where that's what you're asked to do. For example, uh, intentionally lift your arm 
while believing you didn't intend to do it. But maybe there's another group of subjects you might say have high, high order thought control in which they're perfectly capable of um, um, having a strong linkage between higher order thoughts and intentions and often do have a strong linkage between higher order thoughts and intentions but they're capable of controlling it. It's not that they're dozy, it's that they, it's more of a, a skill notion here that they can switch, switch off or switch on those higher order thoughts uh, when they need them strategically. In any case, um, I think the notion that there are more than one way of being high is, is probably a good one and um, I don't have any real evidence up to now um, about how that applies to the research that's been done so far but it wouldn't surprise me if you can get high mindfulness, highly hypnotizable people and they might proceed in the task in a different way. So that will be uh, an avenue for future research. Now I want to turn to what I take to be the key predictions of cold control. So what I take to be the essence of cold control is that hypnosis is essentially metacognitive. It's essentially about changing the link between higher order thoughts and intentions. What that means is that anything that can be done outside of hypnosis can be done as a hypnotic suggestion. You don't lose any abilities because of hypnotic induction because you're responding hypnotically. You could contrast that prediction with theories about hypnosis being essentially hypofrontal in a more general way. For example, the uh, Eric Woody and um, Ken Bauer's theory that hypnosis is a state of um, functional prefrontal lobotomy. You should lose the ability to behave in an executive strategic way uh, when you perform things hypnotically according to that theory. And the converse is also a prediction of cold control. One cannot do anything as a hypnotic suggestion. One cannot do otherwise. The difference is just in whether it felt involuntary. You shouldn't gain abilities. You shouldn't get extra memory performance um, or ability to <coughs> do sporting moves better or uh, anything else just because you did it hypnotically. Does that make sense? So on the first point, can <coughs> hypnotic suggestions involve executive function tasks like exclusion? Well here's a very common suggestion used by stage hypnotists, we can replicate in the lab. You just give the suggestion that henceforth you'll forget, say, the number four. You'll have no further truck with the number four. Then you ask the person to count the numbers, uh, the, the number of fingers on the hand. They go one, two, three, five, six. That's slightly odd. And they carry on seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There's eleven altogether, but there's six on this hand. And six on this hand, which makes twelve, and it's all very confusing. But now what the person has done is they've overcome a habit, one of the strongest habits that you have, namely one, two, three, four, and excluded four. So but on a, on a, on a Jacobi measure, measure, they've excluded four, so four must be the content of a conscious mental state. But that is precisely what the subject denies. They say, I'm really confused, I don't know what's going on, it doesn't add up. Please relieve me of my misery. But from a cold control theory, this is all perfectly understandable. They form in the intention to have no further truck than number four, and that intention can be unconscious, simply by not having higher order thought about it, because, well, highs are that sort of people. Uh, and then you get the... We can take the subjective reports of face value. In other words, we can explain the phenomena as they seem to be presented to us. In fact, Spanos was particularly good at showing, I don't know how many papers he published, but I believe it was well over 100, uh, and in most of those papers, what they were about was showing how strat strategic hypnotic response can be. So, for example, one of the tasks he gave people was to forget a certain number, uh, for forget a certain word, and forget it in any context whatsoever. Um, so, for example, you might be told to forget the word 
bone. And then when given a free association task like dog, people would produce bone at below baseline levels. So in other words, they're now excluding the word bone. They're overcoming habit. They didn't just have a loss of episodic memory. They ceased to have habits to do with producing the word bone as well. So there must have been executive control going on there, executive inhibition. In general, any arbitrary behavior can be hypnotically suggested, including behavior the person may not have engaged in before, like acting like a, an animal or a celebrity, um, or pretending various things, like uh, pretending to be embarrassed or horrified at seeing people, everyone naked in front of you, and so on. And also, many hypnotic suggestions involve not attending to prepotent responses, like not attending to material you're meant to be remembering, and all the cues for memory are right there in front of you, except you don't remember. Not attending to noxious stimuli causing, meant to be causing uh, intense pain. But uh, nonetheless, you can uh, ignore it. So many hypnotic responses, I conclude, are under executive control. You do not lose the powers of strategic action just because you have been given hypnotic induction or engage in hypnotic response. So you don't lose abilities, which would be contrary to um, some of those theories. The flip side of that, according to cold control, is you don't gain any abilities either. So you might say, what about pain control? What about analgesia? People can have operations, including major orthodontal surgery, or cesarean section, with a sole form of anaesthetic being hypnotic analgesia. Not everyone can do that, by the way, but there are people who can, who can do that, yes. I've heard that happening even with like, mindfulness. People that were so experienced in mindfulness that they could like, use that anaesthesia. Mm. In fact, it's an interesting question. Mindfulness can be used to deal with pain. So can hypnotic analgesia. But I think by fundamentally opposite mechanisms. Mindfulness, you attend right at the pain and you look it squarely in the face. Yes? I was uh, considering that this might just be the Hawthorne effect. So it's the idea that it's not so much what you do, it's that you did something. And um, it's like the study where they, they did the lights in the factory and they just found that they didn't, it didn't matter whether they made them brighter or darker, the fact that they changed the lights increased productivity. That, that should, in other words, it could be something like a placebo effect. Yeah. Um, we talked about last lecture why I think placebo and hypnotic analgesia are in fact different phenomena, although maybe partially overlapping. Um, but yes, so I think, so we have placebo analgesia, we have mindfulness uh, ways of dealing with pain, we have hypnotic analgesia, we also have cognitive behavioral uh, therapy ways of dealing with pain. And it's a really interesting question, how do those things relate? And I think uh, hypnotic analgesia is not mindfulness, and maybe some ways the opposite. It's not placebo analgesia, for reasons that I talked about in the pre previous lecture. Uh, but I'll have a PhD student um, starting next year who'll be looking at precisely that, that question and psychopharmacologically ph disentangling those, those different ways of dealing with pain. So now, <clears throat> when it comes to pain control, one thing you all bring up is one can deal with pain non-hypnotically to a surprising degree, either with placebo, with mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy. So do you really gain anything with hypnotic pain control? And that's a controversial question. So some people say, no, you don't gain, gain anything, it's just the pain seems to go away by itself. And that'll be the cold control answer. You could engage in cognitive behavioral strategies, um, but it wouldn't seem to you that you're engaging in any strategies because you're not aware of strategically doing anything, because you're not aware of your intentions. So I'll just leave that as an open question right now, but one thing I want, do want to say is that CBT and these other methods can produce dramatic pain relief. And if there is a difference with hypnotic and non-hypnotic pain relief, it's small. It's a question of picking up a small effect. Yes? So I can't remember if you covered this before, but um, when we're talking about pain control and analgesia, 
is there a way to distinguish whether it's actual subjective pain is reduced or whether it's um, people's like willingness to deal with pain or like just being... Well, pain is two, as often said, pain is two components. One is a sort of a sen the sensory feeling itself, yeah. and the other is how freaked out you are about it. Yeah. So, you, so you have the affective and the sensory components. With hypnosis, you can deal with both components. You can strategically bit one of them, you can reduce both of them. Um, and one thing I mentioned in the last lecture was it's not just people saying things in that the pain matrix, uh, the degree, degree of activity in the pain matrix is shown by fMRI. In other words, the regions of the brain to do with pain that light up when you stick pins in people. Those regions go up and down as people's subjective reports go up and down according to hypnotic suggestion as shown by Stuart Darvishier. Yes? But if a placebo method actually does reduce pain, at least perceptually, to the patient, is it actually placebo? Like, if it works, is it a placebo? Um, yeah, the word placebo um, has several meanings. I mean, one of the original meanings of, of placebo go back a couple hundred years was it's bollocks, it, it's not doing anything, it's um, just a sugar pill, it does nothing. But, an, but another, another meaning of, and that still has that, uh, those connotations to this day, uh, but, the, but the, another meaning of placebo is that it's um, something like an effect of expectancy or conditioning that may have genuine effects on your physiological functioning, in which case it's real. It's just the causal mechanism was expectancy and or conditioning. Uh, and you do get pain control in that second meaning with placebo, so it is real in that sense. Yes? It's, okay, this may sound kind of convoluted, but if one of the theories about placebo is expectancy, yes. and one of the theories about hypnosis is expectancy, yes. might we expect um, that individual differences in hypnotizability could predict individual differences in the placebo effects yes. of people, and yes. also tease apart the two main theories about placebos. Yes, in fact, there is a correlation. So Eric Woody looked at um, placebo drunkenness uh, and got a correlation of 0.3 with hypnotizability. And one would imagine, I mean, hypnosis does involve expectancy, so it would be surprising if there wasn't a placebo component to it at least. Uh, but whether that's all or even the major story is another matter, and I'd argue, based on the evidence to date, that uh, the placebo is is a component, but a small <coughs> component. And one key bit of evidence for that is uh, most most placebos operate by opioid mechanisms in the brain, whereas hypnotic analgesia seems not to, in any way. But when I say in any way, we need to sensibly test that, and we'll be doing that next year. I actually wrote that down as a possible note for an idea. But All right. It's good no, good it. idea. So, what about visual hallucinations? I mean, that seems pretty remarkable. That doesn't one gain the ability to have visual hallucinations? It's sort of an ability, if you like. Uh, something you can do hypnotically, but not hypnotically. And the other thing I mentioned was the Raz Wordliner suggestion, where you reduce substantially reduce the Stroop effect. Seems amazing. Uh, and I'm going to turn to that as well. How does, how does that happen? And isn't that an ability you gain hypnotically? You don't have hypnotically. Okay, in terms of hallucinations, um, here's a project by PhD student Hazel Anderson. Well, when she was a PhD student, she's uh, now a doctor. The hypnotic suggestion was for uh, synesthesia, that digits would be seen, certain digits would be seen in certain colours. So in this array here, which is fives and twos, uh, the subject might be told they'll see a five is red and a two is green. This is what the array that subjects actually saw was. And probably you don't see any shapes pop out at you when you, when you see that top array. But if the different digits, which have been made to be, especially made to be very similar in, in sort of basic geometric properties, other than the mirror images, uh, you see uh, a diamond shape pop out. Well, once you know it's, it's only one of four possible shapes, you'd uh, see that as a diamond shape. At least you see that 
that uh, object there pop out at you, right? Well, now, synesthetes, digital synesthetes, are in fact particularly quick at this task. But what about people that you give a hypnotic suggestion for digital color synesthesia? How does that suggestion operate? Incidentally, even with people with synesthesia, it's, the experience isn't actually quite like that. Um, it's partial coloring. And the same for our hypnotized subjects. They see a portion of the display um, colored. But that would still really help you, because once you see, ah, uh -uh, here's, here's the shape, it's somewhere over here. It will then speed you up in, in, in saying, uh, was it a square, was it a diamond, was it a triangle? So in this paper, we, did, we had exactly the same task with uh, real synesthetes. And in this paper, we have uh, people being hypnotically transformed into synesthetes, at least according to their experience. But in fact, um, we get a non-significant difference, and a non-significant difference found sensitive with a, a base factor. This, this is for a highly hypnotizable people, given the suggestion and with no suggestion, and they didn't acquire any new abilities. They were not more accurate in saying what those shapes were under time pressure um, when given the suggestion for digit color synesthesia. So that fits cold control. They had not acquired. We changed their experiences. The world would seem different to them, but they hadn't actually acquired any new abilities. Well, now, what about the RAS suggestion? And to remind you, that's um, when you're told that um, words on the screen will appear to you as a meaningless foreign script. And the finding is that uh, the reaction time in the incongruent condition of a Stroop test is reduced. People speed up. And so the Stroop interference effect is about approximately halved. <laughs> so in this, this study, uh, the first time I heard about uh, this suggestion, I simply didn't believe that this, this would be replicated. But we've now replicated it. Uh, quite a number of times at Sussex, so I have to accept it exists. Indeed, uh, one study um, in Raz's lab, um, collaboration with Irving Kirsch, found you didn't need to give the induction, the hypnotic induction, to get the effect. And here we're going to see. Uh, we can look at that question and whether lows can produce this this reduction in Stroop when we present it not as a hypnotic task but as a task in the imagination. So we don't give hypnotic induction, we just give it as an imaginative suggestion. Uh, so hopefully lows don't bring in their negative attitudes towards hypnosis because as far as I know this has got nothing to do with, with uh, any hypnosis. Uh, it's just a task about using imagination and doing Stroop. So this is the incongruent reaction time. So this is the condition where the, the word might be blue. That's what the, the word is. But the color in which it's, it's presented might be yellow. So you have to say yellow and ignore the blue. That's the incongruent condition. This is the neutral condition. So just a non-color word here. And you see there's a, a, a difference between the two. And that's the Stroop effect. That's the Stroop interference effect. When we give the suggestion to highs without an induction and not presented as anything to do with hypnosis, just as a, a, an exercise in imagination, we get a Stroop, of, a Stroop interference effect that's about halved. So that replicates the earlier study by Raz. So you don't need an induction. In fact, you don't need people to know this is anything to do with hypnosis for this to work. And I find this comp uh, particularly impressive in that it's the difficult condition that's sped up. I think I might have said before, sometimes in these studies you find that all conditions just become slower after hypnosis, and then you can eliminate differences. 
but any old fool can slow themselves down in all conditions to eliminate differences. The difficult thing is speeding up the incongruent condition, and that's exactly what happens here. Lowe's, however, uh, showed no such effect. So it's as if it's a skill that highly hypnotizable people have, but I still have no idea how they, how they achieve this action. But they don't need, you don't need a hypnotic induction. You don't need to define the circumstances as hypnotic in order to get the effect. So does this support cold control? So on the face of it, the RAS suggestion looks problematic for cold control because people seem to gain an amazing ability. So then I say, ah yes, but you don't need a hypnotic induction. It doesn't need to be hypnotic, so it's not as if hypnosis has given them a special ability. But let's distinguish two uses of the word hypnotic. One use means with versus without hypnotic induction, and that's sort of the operational definition that's often used in the hypnosis literature. But that, from a cold control perspective, that's more or less irrelevant whether or not an induction concern is, is used, because a response can be just as much an action of cold control even without hypnotic induction. An induction is just a procedure that pumps expectations a little bit. It doesn't fundamentally change what's going on. At least, uh, that's what I believe, perhaps controversially. So another uh, meaning of hypnotic is that it's normal action of perception um, that's been altered so that you experience the action as involuntary or your imagination as perception. And that's what makes it cold control. So in that case, uh, back in this experiment, although no hypnotic induction was used here, this may have still been an exercise of uh, some hypnotic process and created an altered sense of perception. And that process may be cold control or it might be something else. Do you see what I mean? So. Whatever theory you have, even if it's not cold control, you might say people can respond hypnotically without a hypnotic induction. So just showing there was no hypnotic induction here doesn't save cold control theory yet. <coughs> we need to show that this response wasn't hypnotic. So how would we do that? So um, I'll finish with this experiment which is sort of, I regard as a key test of cold control. So the idea is that people should be able to produce the same effect, but experience it as volitional. And experience, in the RAS case, experience it not as an altered perception, but as an act of imagination. And then from a cold control perspective, we should still get the reduction in the stroop to the same, exactly the same extent. Because all, all, all we'll do is we want, we want to change the higher order thoughts to be accurate. But then whatever people are strategically doing imaginatively, that should still be in place just as well as it was before. And we should still get the reduction in stroop, even though people experience it as imagination and not as perception. So um, in this study, we created a volition condition where you said you can voluntarily create the experience of the script being meaningless and you can experience the script being a meaningless as your imagination which is under your control. So this is an attempt to say don't use cold control. Whatever powers of cold control you have, don't use them. Just be aware of your intentions to imagine and use your imagination. And subjects rated how strongly they expected to experience the script as meaningless. Because if we change expectations that would be confound, right? The extent to which they experience the script is meaningless and how much control they had over that experience. So in terms of expectations, um, the volitional condition had just as strong expectations as the standard suggestion condition. So control for that, so there should be no... Expectations can't be a confound, in other words. <coughs> we looked at how much control they experienced over the experience of meaningless. The suggestion condition had control on the lower end, no control over whether words was meaningful. Of course, you don't have control over your perception, right? And higher control in the volitional condition, which is 
how uh, imagination works, you control over your imagination. So we created a reasonable difference here in the instructions. So according to cold control is they've just got more accurate higher order thoughts in this volitional condition, but it shouldn't change the effect. But if hypnosis alters perception at a more fundamental level, at a first order le level, we should get more stroop reduction in the suggestion condition than the volitional condition. So we've established conditions for testing cold control. Cold control theory is right, subject to be able to experience the script just as meaningless in the volition condition as the hypnotic suggestion condition. And if we cannot get the same effect in both theories, cold control theory is wrong. There's more to hypnosis than metacognition. So this is the proportion of trials in which the word meaning was clear and consistent with cold control, the, at the level of subjective experience, uh, meaning has been substantially reduced in both conditions, suggestion and volition. In terms of the Stroop effect, there's the no suggestion condition. That's how big the Stroop effect is. There it is substantially halved in the suggestion condition. Now, unfortunately, and I'm going to leave you dangling with this one, the volition condition is halfway between and non-significantly different from either. So what I need to do is to get more data, and the fate of cold control hangs in the balance. So, mystery. So to summarise, cold control gives us a handle on why one cannot do anything in hypnosis one couldn't do otherwise, but hypnosis is still real. Our expectations seem to have much larger effects in hypnotic and typical non-hypnotic contexts because of changing higher order thoughts about intentions, but you're still intending to do various things. Why hypofrontality can sometimes increase hypnotic response when it affects your metacognition, namely. Why mindfulness meditation and hypnosis are opposites. But whether that's all that metacognition is all there is to it, I'm not 100% sure, and I need to run more data on that next year to the last experiment I gave is the acid test of cold control. So I've sort of stated that in advance of getting the, the complete data set. Now I just want to finish with the question, so that's the empirical data, so now just some speculation about why does hypnotic behavior exist. If we take hypnotic behavior to be cold control, namely uh, intentionally doing various motor and cognitive actions while being unaware that it's you intending to do it, then that has happened all through human history, I dare say prehistorically and in all continents, in the form of spirit possession. Because that's what happens in spirit possession. The person does things, uh, but it says that wasn't me. So maybe this comes about just because evolution made our higher order thoughts just so accurate because you don't need to make things perfect, you just need to make them accurate enough. And it's in that gap, that little gap that evolution left for no good reason other than it doesn't make things perfect, that it allows spirit possession and cold control, therefore, to happen. But it might be that it was actively selected for, and I want to consider some reasons for thinking, thinking that. First of all, if you, if you think that we evolved to be religious, maybe to escape the depression that might come about when you realize your own mortality um, and religion helped you get on with life, uh, then, if you thought you were in contact with the spirit world, that would be pretty compelling evidence for the spirits. And if they, if they would um, take over your body, make you do things, uh, and you felt the spirits do that, you, you could become more convinced in the spirit world, more convinced in your religion, and that could help whatever function religion fulfilled. I was pleased to find a book by Lewis, a sociologist, who the whole book was about sociological functions, the usefulness of spirit possession, uh, to the people who are possessed by spirits. <coughs> and he goes through how spirit possession is, as I say, uh, in every culture, on every continent, all through history, you find spirit possession. And what are the, what are the functions uh, that it possesses? We describe one particular common case is where a, a, a wife hasn't been paid much attention by the husband, she becomes um, taken over my spirit who says um, he needs to be propitiated with perfumes, fine clothing, um, jewellery and so on. The husband despairs, goes to the shaman and he says you must propitiate the spirit uh, and then eventually the spirit goes away. 
Sorry, that is common, but it's also common for the people possessed by spirits to, to take on um, as, a, as a shaman or a, a channeler, um, to take on uh, important functions in the society, to acquire status, to acquire some of the um, status of the spirit themselves. Now, cold control would be the ideal way of fulfilling these functions. Because it's executive, you can modulate your response to exactly what's needed in that culture uh, for the spirit to do and behave, produce that in yourself, but then not be aware that you're doing it. And because you're deceiving yourself, you'll be better able to deceive others and thereby gain the full advantage of uh, spirit possession. So that's why I think cold control came about. It's to be possessed by spirits. It's just we have a funny little historical route coming to us as hypnosis. Hypnosis is not really what it was for, it was for spirit possession, um, but um, hypnosis is the form that uh, we see it in in our culture now where spirits are largely poo-pooed. All right, so that wraps up um, my account of hypnosis. <laughs>